It's the morning of any given weekday in your average suburban Washington State neighborhood, and Henry Morrison is getting ready for work. He showers, then shaves. He cuts his hair and puts on a new suit. He takes a moment to tidy up the kids' room on his way out, and then he walks downstairs and practically has to step over the bodies of his dead wife and her children on his way through the door. He picks up the paper and then walks down the street whistling to himself, blending in with the surroundings, becoming just a small piece of this larger landscape of late 80s Americana, transforming into a new man named Jerry Blake in the process. An everyday kind of guy that you can meet in any town in America with an everyday kind of name. He sells houses and has a wife named Susan and a stepdaughter named Stephanie. I think this is one of my favorite openings of all of horror cinema. Without speaking a word, the film sets up who this man is, what he does, how he operates as a serial killer, and how high the stakes are for his new family members, Susan and Stephanie, later on in the film. All with style and an intrigue of mystery of where we're going and why exactly we are watching a man change his appearance in front of the mirror. The Stepfather, released in 1987, is a lot of interesting things that is commonly wrapped in the guise of a slasher which I'm not actually sure if that's the subgenre that it belongs in. The body count is relatively low, with only three people dying in the film. If you don't count the bodies in the opening, that is. And the violence within the story isn't actually that intense. The film is focused more intently on psychology than most slashers were of this time. And at the end of the day, it kind of operates more as a family drama that happens to have a serial killer in it. And I think that's pretty cool. The Stepfather is one of my favorite films of all time for a lot of reasons. But this is one of the biggest ones because its title would lead a lot of people to write it off as pulp trash, but I think it's pretty far from that when you actually look at what's going on within it structurally, as it has a feeling that really no other film has, and there's a few things working together that lead to this. The nature of film screenplays is that they are typically beholden to what can physically be shown on screen. It isn't possible to show what is going on within a character's mind on a second-to-second -second basis, besides what they show on their face. It isn't realistic for them to say exactly how they feel at all times out loud to other people. And oftentimes narrators can feel very... 70s? So that is why almost every movie is based around the actions of characters rather than the internal emotions of those characters and of those actions. Because film is limited to a very specific runtime and the only kind of emotions that are easy to portray on screen in those parameters are large grandiose ones that affect outward expressions of decisions. Motivations are usually kept simple, and that's a good thing, at least for the movies. Groundhog Day screenwriter Danny Rubin, in his collection of tips for screenwriting, says that anybody can create a character who opens his mouth and tells us everything that's on his mind, and some people can even make those words funny or poetic or heartbreaking. But movies are first and foremost a visual medium, and the strongest screenplays take advantage of that. What can a character do to show us how they're feeling and what they're thinking about? The best screenplays are not loaded down with redundancies, but instead are elegant structures characterized by efficiency and economy. Why give a speech when a nod will do? Every aspect of a screenplay is available for simplification, from the twists and turns in the plot to the numbers of characters and scenes to the lines of dialogue. Good screenplays gain power from their simple efficiency. Clever multiple agendas, plot lines, and parallel meanings, for example, may be intellectually satisfying, but can often clog the emotional impact of a story. And this is great. This is why I love movies. It's a very particular medium that you can do very particular things in. And we're talking about film screenplays here only. Game of Thrones works great as a show, but could you imagine how bad a series of five or six films would have been? Film has tight constraints, but seeing what people do within that system with set parameters and original scripts is exciting. But that being said, sometimes when people break those traditional boundaries and happen to succeed, really great things can come about from it. It is usually hard to build actual complex characters within a medium that only allows for an audience to see what a person shows on the outside, especially in a medium that typically is only allocated an hour and a half of time to tell its story. Screenplays have to be efficient in what they're trying to achieve, and that is why film screenwriters are typically focused on writing films based more on decisions and actions of characters, rather than deep emotional psychological movements behind those decisions. But The Stepfather was not written by a screenwriter. It was written by the crime and mystery novelist Donald Westlake, who frequently wrote under other names such as Richard Stark or Alan Marshall, and was one of the only films he wrote in his long career. I think his background is key in setting up the success of the story. 
Because by being filtered through the mind and sensibilities of a novelist rather than a traditional screenwriter, the film is a lot less focused on actions and decisions and more on the mindset of everybody involved within the story. It's a lot more about how everybody feels rather than what everybody does. This is a trademark of Westlake's writing style, as he frequently used morally gray characters in realistic yet somewhat pulpy situations. And it won him the honor of Grand Master of 1993 with the Mystery Writers of America. A high honor that is presented annually that he was distinguished with that has also been given in different years to other notable names, such as Agatha Christie, John Dixon Carr, Alfred Hitchcock, Elmore Leonard, and Stephen King. And so, what I think this boils down to is that The Stepfather is what a slasher movie would look like if it was made by people who don't necessarily make slasher movies themselves, but know how to write and handle characters really, really well. It's the same case with the director, Joseph Rubin, who was known for other films like Sleeping with the Enemy and True Believer, who didn't want to actually direct The Stepfather out of a desire to not make a run-of-the-mill slasher film. And so I think that a lot of the backgrounds and motives of the people involved with the production are what make The Stepfather have its unique identity as a non-slasher slasher movie. Part of this unique ambience also comes from the film taking place almost entirely during the daytime. Like Parents, the first half of Halloween, Carrie, the upcoming Midsommar, and The Hills Have Eyes to name a few, horror that takes place in the daytime casts the normal tropes of the genre to the wayside and is tasked with finding a path to being scary without relying on the normal ways of doing so. And any time that a work of art forces itself or is forced to change from what is normal and established within a certain way of doing things, creative decisions are more likely to happen. There is only one scene in the entire film that takes place at nighttime, but it is still really, really scary because in that David Lynch type of way, it makes horrible things happen in everyday suburban neighborhoods, where blood splatters the homes that have neatly cared for lawns and flower beds with white clean fences. And through that, it makes it more realistic and upsetting to some as a result. I often hear from people that this film is only great because of Terry O'Quinn's performance in it. I've seen it online and Roger Ebert said it at the time of his review when the film came out. And while he is amazing here, I don't think that's really fair. Films are not made by one person and everything in the production is set up for him to succeed. It does all hinge on his performance. But without the excellent writing, setting, supporting cast, costuming, and direction, he wouldn't have had a foundation to hold this film up with. But with that, he was enabled to give the performance of a lifetime and creates the most nuanced on-screen serial killer of all time. The sad, unsettling, and depressing facts about these kinds of men is that even if we don't want to admit it, they aren't creepy 24 hours a day and at least on the surface level seem to be well-socialized, normal members of a community. There's a reason that they typically don't get caught for years and that some go their entire lives without ever facing justice. And that is what horror movies about killers should be about. Because the sheer emotional-based terror of knowing someone who is not actually who they say they are is exponentially more upsetting than actually watching them do what they do in the shadows. So while I enjoy movies like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, The Silence of the Lambs, No Country for Old Men, Seven, and Hounds of Love for what they do around killers, I don't really like that all of these men scream that they are creepy psychos from 20 miles away. It just isn't realistic even if we wanted that to be the case. In most situations, the men in these movies would have been caught in weeks, not years. They don't properly demonstrate the psychological profile of what these men tend to actually be like in real life, and instead perpetrate further our ideas of what killers should actually be like. And that is fine. These things are ultimately just for entertainment. But here, instead of the normal treatment of these types of characters, Terry O'Quinn's Jerry Blake haunts the films in normal barbecues and offices, instead of blood-soaked kill rooms. Scenes go by that are weighted with dread of just people eating, buying houses, and checking their mail, and they're only scary because of the context of the first scene of the film. Jerry is a broken man who has wants and goals and desires. He just wants a family and people to love who also love him and accept him for who he is. But because of a mental defect that he can't actually help within himself, he can never have that, which presents itself on the surface in truly horrible ways. Jerry Blake, because of this, in the first movie at least, is one of the most three-dimensional villains in horror film history. Westlake in his script tries to make you sympathize with a person that the first thing you see him do is murder innocents. And to me, at least, that is a really daring and interesting thing for a story to do. You don't have to feel sorry for him, it doesn't ask you to agree with his actions, 
but it does force you to see him as a living, breathing person who has emotions too. And because of that, he is a lot scarier to me than the normal cartoon villain levels of evil that killers normally possess in films. Typical Hollywood ventures try to show these men as monsters who bear no resemblance to real people. That they aren't a part of the human experience too, that they are beasts in a cloak of human flesh. But the stepfather rejects that. The real world story is a lot more gray and complex. And instead of scaring you by his actions, it tries to scare you by showing how similar he really is to yourself. Because at the end of the day, all Jerry Blake wants is love, and I don't know anything more human than that. The film is also great because it plays on the unnerving horror that a tremendous amount of kids have to go through in their lives. Where, after experiencing trauma when one parent dies or both parents decide to divorce, eventually there comes this new kind of fear. Where now this invading force enters the house and calls itself your new parent. And most kids struggle with that to an extent. It's hard to accept the new reality that conflicts with the one that you've known most of your life. Westlake himself drew on his experiences with his own stepchildren when writing the film. And I think it's just something that is really common for people to go through that isn't ever really explored that much on screen in a horror aspect. So to have that invading force enter this child's life, and then to actually have that fear validated when he tries to kill her and her mother is a really great idea. And just quickly before we move on as a tangent, I just wanted to say that the way this was filmed just makes me nostalgic for a time that I never lived in, which very few pieces of media can do. Like, It's a Wonderful Life for the 40s, or All in the Family for the 70s. The stepfather feels so intrinsically 80s that it's able to make me reminisce and commune with a time that I don't actually know. But through things like this, I feel like I do. Where most horror films from this era present a fun, idealized 80s filled with crazy parties, fashion, and atmosphere, here we find something more closer to reality, I imagine. Pictures of Ronald Reagan hanging in the school classes. Teenagers listen to Pat Benatar with red headphones late at night. Families sit in leaf-covered autumn backyards and sweaters. And there's just something about it that makes me both cozy and reflective. The film was released in January of 1987. And even though it wasn't a hit at the box office, it was well received. Terry O'Quinn was nominated for a Spirit Award, the NSFC Award, and a Saturn Award. Westlake was nominated for an Edgar, and Rubin won the Critics Award for Best Director. Roger Ebert hated it, but that isn't really surprising because he usually hated fun things, especially during the 80s. And all of this garnered enough interest to make a direct-to-video sequel, The Stepfather 2, Make Room for Daddy, in 1989. I think the thing that I appreciate the most about this movie is that it is pretty much the only film in the entire franchise that actually tries to make a legitimate sequel to the original that continues the ideas that that movie had. As 3 is pretty much a remake of the first one and the 2009 entry is just an outright remake. Where the next two entries will rush to get the stepfather married to the new mother as quickly as possible, this one doesn't do that and instead looks at the previous film and asks, what would happen next? The script isn't the best, this time being written by John Arbach, who had never written anything professionally before and hasn't again since. But at least he tries to catch the ball and run with it. And by doing so, he writes the only sequel that isn't formulaic in what it's trying to achieve. We start with the stepfather in a mental institution, after being shot and stabbed in the heart with a chef's knife at the end of the last entry. But it's a horror sequel, so you can't nitpick that much, I guess. I actually normally wouldn't hate this kind of opening because they do it surprisingly well. We see a relationship build between the stepfather and his caseworker that while only being a microcosm of about 10 minutes long, it feels pretty fleshed out. It also doesn't ruin the mysterious nature that the first film built, which I really appreciate. Because one of the coolest aspects of that one to me is that you have no clue how many times the stepfather has actually gone through a family or even what his real original name was. So the fact that we get to see therapy sessions with him without spoiling it by giving away his backstory shows to me that Arbok really understood what the first movie was trying to do. He isn't the strongest writer. There are a lot of structural problems like killing the main opposition to the stepfather about 20 minutes before the actual climax begins. But what I see is a diamond in the rough that while not a classic like the first film is, is still a really solid chapter within 80s horror. We then see what the stepfather's life is like when he's not with a family after he breaks out of the institution. As he is single most of the film, we see him get a house, start a new profession as a group therapist, 
and casually date. And I love this because it is a logical way to flesh out the world presented in the first movie without just doing the same thing again that that one did. He doesn't even get engaged until around the 50 minute mark. And the wedding itself is the climax of the movie, as opposed to all of the other films where he is married by the end of the first quarter. Is it the best? No. The production values aren't high because it was intended just for a VHS release. Jeff Burr isn't as strong of a director as Ruben is. The dead people blink but it's trying really hard to replicate the magic of the first movie, and I have to respect that. And I feel like it would have been able to succeed even more if it weren't for one thing. I feel like it's an ongoing theme with this channel at this point, where in these franchise videos, Bob and Harvey Weinstein show up somewhere in the middle to ruin what could have been amazing franchises. So, while The Stepfather 2 was in post-production, Bob and Harvey Weinstein watched a rough cut of it and demanded changes to be made. They said that entire scenes had to be cut, and that some of them had to be reshot to add more blood and carnage. And they turned The Stepfather 2 into a movie more in line with what was popular at the time, which is something that these movies decidedly weren't trying to be. The director, Jeff Burr, was really frustrated by this, and so him and Terry O'Quinn outright refused to participate in the reshoots. Which is why there's a lot of close-ups to bloody hands in the film. Because the Weinsteins recut the picture and had the reshoots be done anyways without them. So all of the shots that had more blood in them had to be cutaways to bloody objects or hands covered in blood because O'Quinn wasn't physically there. And ultimately, this was probably the final straw that pushed him away from the future entries of the franchise. It also was in this time that they decided to release the film theatrically. And so in November of that year, the film came out and made a little over a million dollars. I would love to see what The Stepfather 2 could have been originally. Maybe it still wasn't great, but I imagine that it was probably a lot better than what it currently actually is. Because what they made would have been more in line with the vision that the first entry laid out. As there are still a lot of hints of what this film once was before it was dismantled, and then later Frankenstein back together into a more conventional horror feature. I can't really find information about how this came about, but somehow the series returned three years later in the form of an HBO original film in 1992. This right here is the absolute low point of the franchise, even worse than the 2009 remake. But that being said, I certainly enjoy it a lot more than that remake because it's just really fun to watch and it makes me laugh the whole time. I just find crazy and stupid a lot more fun than polished and boring. One thing that I can say is that this is probably the bluest damn opening of any movie ever made. The entire first nine minutes has this weird blue filter over it for no apparent reason. This isn't a flashback, it takes place after the second one. My only guess is that this is probably done in a Kill Bill sort of way, because this section has more violence and blood than the entire rest of the movie. But I'm not really sure. It starts with the stepfather getting a backroom facial reconstruction surgery to look like somebody else, because Terry O'Quinn refused to do another one of these. Which, I can't blame him, because there literally isn't much you can do with this character besides have him do the same thing over and over again. So instead of O'Quinn, this time we get Robert Whiteman from The Waltons. I think the funniest part about this opening is that it was really obvious that they knew people would be upset that the stepfather was being played by a different person. So they try to ease you into it in stages, but it's just really goofy to see the links that they go to make you believe that John Boy Walton can be scary. So, in the first nine minutes, he is either hidden out of frame by other objects or has his face wrapped in bandages from the surgery. We then cut to this Easter party where he's in a bunny outfit for these kids at a church function, and he has his head covered by the suit and he has makeup on with fake whiskers. And this goes on for a long time. We don't finally see his actual face unobscured until 17 minutes into the movie. He's the main character, and we don't see his face for nearly 20 minutes even though he's on screen almost the entire time. This whole movie is the great value version of the first film. It goes beat by beat remaking that movie, just in a more 90s direct-to-VHS kind of way, where nobody is believable and everybody's just super over the top. Where in the first movie you have a well fleshed out kid who has a personal life and characteristics and traits that make her seem like a person. Here you have the physical personification of the 90s in child form, complete with a free range pet turtle. The characterization of the stepfather kind of becomes a joke too. Like before when he went to the basement in the first movie to freak out, it was because he couldn't hold together the fake exterior anymore, as his facade was slowly crumbling around him. But now, he just kind of does it out in the open in the backyard where anybody could just see it. And you can just tell that they had no idea why these scenes were important before or why they were even in the movie or how they should properly use them. 
Also, it's here that we have to address an issue that literally every single one of these movies has, but it's at its worst here. And that's that almost every single female character is oblivious to the things going on around her in this franchise. Susan in the first movie is the best and most fleshed out out of all the wives that the stepfather has. But Carol, Christine, and Susan in the remake all witness massive red flags about their new husbands that they just kind of write off as personality quirks. And that's kind of a problem. It mostly isn't a big deal for me in the first movie because it implies that the stepfather purposefully preys on single middle-aged women who are a little depressed and lonely. And sadly, I can believe somebody overlooking a giant red flag in their relationship if they suddenly have a companion after a long period of being alone. And in a way, as bad as it sounds, from a writing perspective to make these kinds of narratives work, you need a slight bit of a distracted personality on the part of the wife. Because these movies are ultimately about her children catching onto the truth about the stepfather and trying to take him down even though they're just a kid. I mean, that's why these movies are called The Stepfather and not The New Husband. But where Westlake does it with grace and making Susan seem like a real human who has a real personality, she has obvious likes and dislikes, even though she doesn't catch on to who Jerry is late into the game, everyone else, however, whoever handled the franchise was a little clumsy in this department, at least to me. Like, in the second movie. Carol doesn't think that it's odd that her fiancé is out of the house with no alibi the same night that her best friend is murdered, and that he just shows back up in the middle of the night with a bottle of her best friend's favorite wine. And in this movie, the writing team makes Christine to be an absolute idiot. And that's a shame to me because it isn't needed to make this kind of story work. It just makes it a lot easier on the writer if she's stupid and doesn't notice his evil doings. The stepfather murders his boss and starts dating another woman in the same town, who she is friends with but she doesn't notice at all. He doesn't even come home at night sometimes after they're married and she's just sad about it, and doesn't really push him to answer where he actually was or what he was actually doing when he says that he was just at work late. It's really obvious to everybody, including the small kid, that he killed the preacher, but somehow she doesn't catch on. Then the day of the preacher's funeral, she doesn't think it's weird that he's just walking around all giddy and excited while everybody else is really sad. I just don't like watching this one that much for that reason. Because when all the characters aren't on a semi-even playing field, then stories like this aren't fun for me. Because it removes all chances of him getting caught. Also, he definitely tries to murder his girlfriend at one point in the story, but in the middle of it gets caught by these two old ladies who just act like it's a cute game to pretend to sneak up on someone from behind with a hammer. I don't know. But... The movie overall is horrible, so it's just hard to tear it apart because everything is kind of equally bad. There is this really bizarre friendship between the 60-something preacher and the little boy and they both really like murder mysteries. It has the funniest sex scene I've probably ever seen outside of the room. There's one other scene where he thinks that the kid in the wheelchair is faking being paralyzed. So he knocks him over with a football and then tries to make him stand up and won't help him get back into his chair. Only for it to be revealed at the end of the film during the climax that he can actually stand. The movie also ends in a way that would make it impossible to continue on and make more sequels, which is probably for the best. As after Christine and the girlfriend Jennifer kill him, they feed his body into the wood chipper and, in the same tradition of so many bad horror movies that have come before, they walk away slowly after defeating him as the screen slowly fades to black, because they have no other way of ending a movie in a creative fashion. And with this, the franchise sat dead in the water for about 20 years. Until in 2009, Screen Gems, which is a subsidiary of Sony Pictures, decided to remake The Stepfather, starring Nip Tuck's Dylan Walsh in the titular role. Under the direction of Nelson McCormick, who had just remade Prom Night for them, McCormick offered Terry O'Quinn a role in the film as a supporting character, but he turned it down. Which was a solid move on his part, because he was in the middle of the most high-profile role of his career as John Locke on Lost. I love bad remakes, because it gives you two pieces of media that are both trying to achieve the same goals and tell the same story, with one doing it really well and the other one doing it really poorly. They tend to reinforce why the original worked so much, and can often give you clarity and insight into the construction of that particular story. You can learn just as much, if not more, about writing from a bad movie as you can a good one. And with a remake, you can compare them really easily. And so, with the 2009 Stepfather remake, I think the screenwriting is the biggest issue at play. If you go back to what Danny Rubin had to say on screenwriting back at the beginning of the video, you can basically boil down his points to say that screenplays need to be simple and efficient in everything they do to have a good structure about them to tell a good story in an hour and a half. And even though the first Stepfather breaks a lot of conventional rules to screenwriting, 
It holds true to that really well. There really are only three main characters and three side characters, and because of that everybody feels really well developed and fleshed out and they seem like actual people. But in the remake you now have the stepfather, his new wife, her ex-husband, her three children, the girlfriend of one of the kids, the elderly neighbor, the new wife's sister, and this lady. And as a result of adding these additional needless entities to the story, you create an explosion of subplots. There really is enough material here that if you'd given it the proper time that it needed to develop, you could have a proper stepfather TV show. The main plot of all of these films, for the most part, is that the kids think that the stepfather is secretly evil and is trying to investigate his past without him finding out. And their goal is to make sure their family is safe from this invading force within their lives. So everything in the film should be geared towards getting us to that goal. And say what you want to about Stepfather 2 and Stepfather 3, they mostly do this fairly well in their own kind of campy style. The remake, however, does not. The original film has roughly three subplots that each tie into the main narrative and reinforce it as a story to make the overall plot stronger. You have Stephanie's relationship with her friends and her therapist that gives insight as to how she feels about her new stepfather. You have Jerry's dead wife's brother trying to pick up the case after the police refuse to move forward with it, adding pressure to Jerry to keep his new family together. And you have Jerry trying to set up another new family in another town after he decides that it isn't possible to keep them all together and that he has to kill Stephanie and Susan to start over. Each of these things tie in directly to the emotions of a character and how they all relate to each other while also adding pressure to the building tension within these relationships. And they're each important in fully experiencing and understanding what's going on with everybody involved. The remake, however, has arguably 13 different subplots, and most of them don't really relate to the larger narrative of David secretly being a serial killer that the stepson Michael has to stop. And most of these should have been cut in the writing process to spotlight three or four of them at the most that added to the understanding of the main events of the story. There is the old lady that lives next door that figures out who David really is by watching America's Most Wanted. There's David over-disciplining the kids, which sparks another subplot of their biological father hating David, which in turn sparks another subplot about the biological father's relationship with his older son, Michael. And to mirror all of that, we have to have one about Michael's relationship with David. And to see how he feels about all of this, we have to have one of Michael's relationship with his girlfriend, who is trying to help him get into college so that he can have somebody to talk to that isn't directly involved with any of this. We also have one about Michael not doing well in school for behavioral issues, so he is attending military school, which sets up a conflict with his mom, and one where David is trying to convince Michael that he isn't a serial killer, so he talks to the swim coach of the school to get him back on the swim team after he got kicked off. There's also an entire movie within this movie about the mom's sister. She gets David a job at her realty company, and there's a subplot where she's trying to get him to sign the paperwork so he can start working, which he can't do because he has a fake identity. So he quits and there's another subplot about him trying to find a job online. And this makes the sister really suspicious, so there's another one of her trying to convince her sister that he's really creepy, and she also investigates him privately on her own by hiring an investigator. And then lastly, there's a lot of scenes of the sister talking with this lady about everything that's going on with the movie, and I have no clue who she's supposed to be or why she's here. She might be a girlfriend, or just a friend, or maybe even another sister, it's never clear. This movie is an hour and 42 minutes long. That isn't really enough time to do half of this stuff well, and as a result it leaves really important stuff out of the movie like David's motivation. There's no subtlety on display here, we don't have time for that. Instead of letting his true self loose in the basement where no one can see, he now just does it in the house and out in public in daylight. He's creepy all the time, and there's no real reason to show why Susan would fall in love with this man that is constantly creeping around doing weird stuff like putting locks on everything and hitting her kids. Jerry Blake in the original is a complex character. He looks out at the world and sees the archetype of a nuclear family and wants that, but knows that that is a goal that he can't achieve because of a deep flaw within himself. And that makes him sad and depressed and that manifests in pure violence and rage. But we have so much time here devoted to different things that aren't actually important that David has very little motivation behind his actions besides don't get caught. And that's pretty boring. And because he has no motivation for what he's doing, it never really hits home that all he wants is a family. So you can't understand his actions unless you've seen the original film that this one is based on. 
This movie, because of that, literally doesn't stand up on its own. And so by taking the one child and splitting her into three children, ruining the stepfather character, resurrecting the dead husband of Susan, and adding a sister for Susan, the script becomes overly bloated and nothing works as a result. I think having the neighbor find out who David really is is also one of the biggest sins. Because this scene is with the daughter Stephanie in the original. And by inventing a new character just for this moment, it removes agency and cleverness from an already existing character. And I just don't know why you would do this. Everything in this movie is done like it would be done in a typical 2000s horror film, which is easily my least favorite decade of modern horror. And as a result, we come out worse for wear in the end. The introduction that I love so much from the first movie is probably the most dramatic example of this. The first one was four minutes long, the new one is five minutes long. But the major difference is in what they show. The new version of it arguably shows more. Bloody tools in the sink, close-ups on the horrible reality of it all. But to me, this right here is much more impactful. This really looks like something horrible happened, and this looks like a cheap 2000s horror movie. It's just the overall aesthetics at play. Everything has that weird, unnatural blue tint to it that just reminds me that I'm watching a movie. And everything down to the shaving equipment is framed like it's the scariest stuff that has ever existed. Which just makes it all kind of feel silly. And the way that the two scenes sound is important too. Listen to both here real quick. I think you can see what I mean. <laughs> It's a case of the new one trying to one-up the shock factor instead of just being good. The 2000s was the period of super gore and crazy violence and shocking imagery, which can be really fun, but it rarely had any substance to back any of it up. At least, that's how I see a large portion of what was happening at this time. So where you have a character in the first movie trying to find another character in the attic, now you have that same character trying to find three characters in the attic, and there's a crowbar knife fight, and everybody falls through the ceiling, and the buzzsaw nearly misses the girlfriend's head, and so on. Also, as a side note, the product placement in this movie is just horrible. I don't really mind the Apple products or the Just For Men's hair products, because those would probably be sitting around an actual normal house. But I do feel like 10% of this movie is just an advertisement for Burnout Paradise on the PS3. They play the game in four different scenes, and even have the case balanced up against the TV like a display so you know what game it is. Nobody on Earth has ever once taken the disc out of the box and sat it upright against the TV while they're using it. It's nonsensical. So, that brings us to today, ten years later. And the Stepfather franchise is, again, long dead. And at least to me, that's probably a good thing. I do actually love the first three movies for different reasons, of course, but I know that there was only one actually objectively good one in the bunch. And really the only way to continue making the movies in this franchise is to remake the first one again and again and again, because when you have a killer with such a specific M.O., that's all you can do. Really the biggest problem that has always faced this franchise is that it became a franchise in the first place. I know that it's kind of the horror thing to give sequels to literally almost everything, but I think this should have been one of the few that was left alone. Normally, I end these by saying that I'm hopeful for what comes next. Because with most franchises, I genuinely am. But this time, I'm gonna say that I'm hopeful that this is the end of the story. That they tried again a few different times and it didn't work. And that's okay. Because we will always have that first movie that made us question the very people that we hold closest to us. That examine the type of person who lives constantly under multiple lies and fake identities. Who one day looks around and says, Wait a minute. Who am I here?